Today we're going to discuss youth sports. As I've noted previously, among incidents that lead to higher rates of community spread, the outbreaks tied to youth sports are particularly troubling. During a previous update, I noted that dozens of students and parents tested positive in a Lake Zurich outbreak that was worsened by sports camps. And a teen softball league in Knox County was plagued by similar issues. On its own and for the safety of its players and families, the Central Illinois Youth Football League entirely canceled its youth season. On Sunday, the football program in Tuscola, Illinois, cut off all activities until further notice. Nationally, over half of states have districts that have shut down training due to COVID-19 outbreaks. Whether they're new to the game or have been training since they could walk, kids want to play sports. Parents want to cheer from the stands and watch the kids succeed and offer some occasionally unsolicited advice for the next game. Some young people are working toward a scholarship so that they can fund their college education. These are incredibly important moments in the lives of our children and our families and interrupting the season for our athletes and their fans is not a choice that anyone wants to make. But when the multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar sports leagues with multi-million dollar athletes are struggling to protect their players, it's obvious that there won't be enough protection for kids on our school playing fields. The NBA has resorted to containing its players in a bubble in Orlando to press on with its season. MLB is facing down a major outbreak just days into its abbreviated fan-free season. This virus is unrelenting, and it spreads so easily that no amount of restriction seems to keep it off the playing field or out of the locker room. And it's very painful, frankly, for all of us to make this realization. But with rising rates of spread of the virus, with rising positivity rates throughout Illinois and the entire United States, this is a situation where the toughest choice is also the safest choice. Therefore, today, my administration is releasing new guidance restricting youth and adult recreational organized sports in Illinois. That includes school-based sports, such as those governing, governed by the IHSA and IESA, travel clubs, private leagues, recreational leagues and sports centers, and park district sports programs, just to name a few uh, in the array of examples. We have worked in consultation with the governing bodies of many of these organized sports programs, and collectively, we hope that when metrics and risks improve measurably, we will be able to restart these sports. I want to be clear that the restrictions issued today do not include professional sports leagues or collegiate level sports. I know our hearts break when we hear the words restrictions, especially when it comes to our children's love for their sports. Whether this year is their first time on the court or it's their senior year season, this isn't news that anyone wants to hear. But this virus remains dangerous to kids and parents and grandparents and teachers and coaches. And for right now, this is the best thing that we can do for the health and safety of our families under the current circumstances. Based upon their inherent risk level and based upon minimal contact between athletes and their proximity during play, there are certain sports whose seasons can move forward with more limited restrictions. Tennis and baseball, as examples, simply don't carry the higher risk inherent in contact sports like wrestling and football. That differentiation is reflected in these guidelines, which categorize each sport into three overarching risk levels, lower, medium, and higher. Think of these guidelines like a grid. Three risk levels of sports and four tiers of levels of play based on current public health conditions. At each of the four tiers, different aspects of play are permitted from no contact practices that include conditioning and training at level one 
to full-scale tournaments in level four. Effective August 15th, lower risk sports like tennis and baseball and golf can be played at levels one, two, and three with activities like no contact practices, team scrimmages, and certain competitive games allowed with DPH safety guidelines. Medium risk sports like basketball, soccer, and volleyball can be played at levels one and two with no contact practices and team scrimmages allowed. And higher risk sports like football, hockey, and lacrosse can be played at level one with no contact practices and trainings and conditionings only. I won't go through all the sports and what activities are allowed at each level for each sport, but you can read all about these and the guidelines on the state's coronavirus website. I will also add that the IHSA, the independent body that regulates most school sports, is meeting now to determine how fall sports should move forward in a way that is safe, safe as possible for its participants. I commend the IHSA and the IESA before them for taking difficult but prudent steps to protect our young athletes, their coaches, and their families. Of course, if sports were the only risk during this pandemic, we'd have solved this problem a long time ago. So let's take this opportunity to remind everyone that we are far from out of the woods. 150,000 people have died in the United States in just four months, a third of a year. As much as I'd like to, this virus isn't something that we can wish away. So we have to act responsibly and collectively to protect the people that we love. We've made progress in Illinois, but we've also seen that it can be fleeting. And right now, things are not heading in the right direction. I want to remind everyone that it doesn't take long at all for a trajectory of success to turn into rising hospitalizations and deaths. And if things don't change, a reversal is where we're headed. Last week, I mentioned that while we're seeing a rolling seven-day average positivity rate of 7.1% in Metro East, Metro East is now at 7.8%. And last week, the other 10 regions all fell below 5%. Now six of our regions are above 5%. Within regions, that rate varies by county. And if you're a local elected official and your local numbers are rising, it's time to step up and impose stricter mitigations. And residents should hold your elected leaders accountable. Demand that they take action, because if they don't, they could send the entire region back to closed bars and closed restaurants, stricter limits on gatherings, or even another stay-at-home order. I'll also remind the residents of Metro East that Region 4 on our map, that three consecutive days of that positivity rate sitting at or above 8% brings with it additional mitigations for the entire region. That could mean the closure of bars, the reduction of service at restaurants, and smaller capacity caps on other activities. Should that region continue in this direction, I'll be making additional announcements related to the specifics of the reversal. Folks, this is serious. It didn't take long for Florida, Texas, Arizona, and California to become plagued with high rates of infection and death. That was once where we were, just 10 weeks ago. We hunkered down and we did the right thing and we made progress, but now there are danger signals as states all around us are spreading the virus and some of our own people in Illinois haven't gotten the message about wearing masks and abiding by the mitigations. It's time to defend our progress and put us back on the right trajectory for a healthier and safer Illinois. So let me remind everyone, taking precautions, following the recommended mitigations like wearing masks in public places and keeping some physical distance and refusing to indulge those who flout public health guidance. These are the best things that you can do to keep our economy moving forward and looking out for your friends and family. This isn't about politics or what party your governor belongs to or whether this is how you wanted to spend your summer or your fall. 
This is about doing right by the people that we love. Thank you, and now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Ngazi Azike for today's medical update. Doctor. Thank you, Governor. I will start today with an update on COVID-19 data, including cases, deaths, and hospitalizations. Today, we are reporting 1,393 people newly diagnosed with COVID-19, which brings our statewide total to 175,124 cases. Since yesterday, 18 additional Illinoisans lost their battle with COVID-19 for a total of 7,462 lives lost. As of last night, 1,491 individuals were in Illinois hospitals with COVID, and of those, 355 were in the ICU, and 152 were on ventilators. For the last 24 hours, we have resulted 38,187 lab results, which brings our statewide total of tests to 2,608,652 tests. Unfortunately, as the governor has said, we are seeing what much of the country is seeing in terms of a resurgence in the number of cases. Uh, not only have we started to see an increase in the cases over the past several weeks, but we're also seeing a slight increase in hospital admissions as well. These are clearly indicators that we are headed in the wrong direction. In six out of the 11 regions of Illinois, we have seen increased test positivities and increase in positivity for seven out of the last 10 day period. Some places may be flat, but over the last 30 days, every region has seen significant increases. The virus doesn't recognize county lines. It doesn't respect any regional borders. The virus is spreading throughout Illinois and more counties are heading into a warning level status. Recall back to mid-May, we reported four th over 4,000 new cases within a 24-hour period. And at our peak, we reported 191 new deaths. Right now, again, we reported uh, just under 1,400 new cases uh, and 18 deaths, all still too high, but we can't continue to increase back to where we were. Counties and communities across the entire state that start seeing an increase need to look critically at what mitigation actions will slow the spread. Uh, are there outbreaks associated with places of worship? Are you seeing that there are additional steps that should be taken at the workplace? What are you seeing with your sports teams? Are people wearing a mask when they go into businesses? What about large social events or gatherings? Are those still being held individually and at the community level, we all have a responsibility to play. I know that we want to have our bachelor's parties, we want to have our house parties, those regular old basement parties, but we have to think about how we can keep ourselves and our community safe. I know that each community is a little different and the approach to controlling the spread will maybe look a little different based on what some of the key factors are. We're asking all of the communities to take a look at what they're seeing. Please identify what mitigation efforts you can implement to slow the spread. Maybe that does mean that your favorite restaurant goes back to takeout only. Maybe the family reunion you are planning for this summer needs to be rescheduled. We are still having to make sacrifices because this pandemic is not over. And each of us is called to make that personal sacrifice now to avoid making a much larger one down the road. I know we all want to be done with this virus. Believe me, the coronavirus fatigue uh, is real. I get it. But the virus is not done with us, however done we want to be with it. So we can't stop our efforts. If you're in the pharma industry, all of us are supporting your efforts. We're waiting on you to figure out a cure and a vaccine. For the rest of us, there is still something that we can do. And those simple truths are to watch your distance, the six feet, wear a mask. And let me just highlight that the mask needs to be wear, worn to cover your nose as well. I know a lot of times it's worn uh, just over the mouth. Make sure the mask covers the nose. 
and then wash your hands. Commit to using a sanitizing station every time you pass them. People are setting it out. They are available. Don't go buy one without using it. Watching your distance, wearing a face covering, and washing your hands, that's what we can all do. That's what we can all do to protect ourselves, our families, our friends, our community, our state. Thank you for taking on these measures to do what's right for all of us. Thank you. Now I'll summarize comments in Spanish. Buenas tardes. Empiezo hoy con el reporte de casos, muertes y hospitalizaciones a causa de COVID-19. Hoy informamos 1,393 personas recién diagnosticadas con COVID-19 para un total, total más de 175,000 casos desde el comienzo de esta batalla. Desde ayer se reporta 18 personas con COVID-19 han muerto por un total de más de 7,400 vidas per perdidas. Informó que 1,491 personas en, en Illinois estaban en el hospital con COVID-19. De ellos, 355 pacientes estaban en la unidad de cuidados intensivos y 152 pacientes estaban en ventiladores. En las últimas 24 horas se han hecho más de 38,000 pruebas. Desafortunadamente, estamos viendo lo que el país está viendo, un resurgimiento de los casos. No solo hemos comenzado a ver un aumento en los casos en las últimas semanas, también estamos comenzando a ver un aumento en las admisiones al hospital. Estos son señales fuertes de que nos vamos en la dirección equivocada. El virus no reconoce las líneas del condado ni respeta a las 11 regiones. El virus se está propagando en Illinois y más condados se encuentran en un estado de nivel de aviso. Los condados y las comunidades en todo el estado que comienzan a ver un aumento necesi necesitan ver qué acciones de mitigación bajará la propagación. ¿Hay brotes asociados con cadas de culto? ¿Lugares de trabajo o equipos deportivos? ¿Las personas no usan una máscara cuando entran en negocios? ¿Todavía se celebran grandes eventos sociales? ¿Celebraciones de la vida o fiestas en casa? Cada comunidad es un poco diferente y el enfoque para controlar la propagación del virus también se verá un poco diferente. Pedimos a las comunidades que echen un ojo a lo que están viendo y ven qué esfuerzos temporales de mitigación pueden implementar para frenar la propagación. Tal vez eso significa que su restaurante favorita se vuelva solo a comida para llevar o la reunión familiar que estaban planeando se hace el próximo año. Todavía tenemos que hacer sacrificios. Esto no ha terminado. Y si cada uno de nosotros no hace un pequeño sacrificio personal ahora, tenemos que, no tenemos que hacerlo más adelante. Sabe, sabemos lo que se necesita para frenar la, propagas, frenar la propagación. Cuida tu distancia. Usa una máscara. Lávese las manos. Haga lo correcto para protegerse no solo a usted, pero también a su familia, sus amigos y su comunidad. Muchísimas gracias para su apoyo. And with that, I will turn it over to Governor Pritzker. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Happy to take any questions from members of the media. Yeah, Mary. Governor, hi. Thank you. If, if we're going to restrict sports, what does that tell parents about school? Yeah. Um, one district is already, Barrington has decided to go to all remote. Others are considering it. Mm -hmm. Would you feel good about your kids going to school right now? I think each school is trying to set plans for their school. I've said all along here that the, the um, uh, ISB has been putting out guidance to make sure that there are some basic requirements like masking in schools that are adhered to, but because each school is so much different, they're different campuses, they're differently configured buildings, different numbers of people in a building per square foot, we really want those schools to make decisions for themselves. But there's no doubt about it, I'm watching very closely. If the numbers continue to rise, you know, we're moving on 
uh, regions if they uh, trip the 8% uh, uh, metric or the other metrics that we've set out uh, to try to put mitigations in place. And, and we're watching carefully about schools and whether or not um, you know, they're opening and doing the right thing, uh, opening safely. I'm particularly concerned about school districts that are talking about opening without any masks, which is, of course, against the rules in the state of Illinois. Um, it's also uh, unsafe and unhealthy for not just the kids, but also the teachers, the administrators, the paraprofessionals, and the families who come to school often uh, several times a week. Governor, yesterday the, uh, the mayor added uh, four states, I believe, to the quarantine list for Chicago. Have you considered a similar uh, quarantine uh, for people for the state of Illinois, for people coming from other states? You know, I haven't. And the reason is that, uh, as you know, we have many people that live in border communities who might work on the other side of the border. On both sides, I might add. People who live in Wisconsin work in Illinois. People who live in Illinois work in Iowa and so on. Um, I don't want to restrict their activities. Um, uh, I do think this is e exactly the example of why we needed national mandates, why we needed a national strategy around COVID-19. Uh, because you can't, there's no way to protect a border. You know, we have half the uh, positivity rate of some of our neighbors and a third of others. And uh, I would like very much to, you know, to have Illinois be, you know, the lowest in the nation. Um, I'd also like to have the whole nation have their positivity rates go down. Um, so I, I just don't think it's practical. Uh, and so I haven't imposed that. Um, but I will adhere to uh, that rule because I live in the city of Chicago. But does that mean your family will as well? Sure, of course. They will. Can you be more... Uh, Describe Expansive for your camera. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean folks sure. don't know. Yes. Will, will you I and my to... family will follow the rules that have been set up by the mayor for people who live in the city of Chicago. Governor, let's Can talk you... about travel sports. Sorry, I was sure. coaching, that's why I'm late on CPS. So does this start tomorrow? Um, no, I believe that the I believe the start date is the middle of the month because there are sports going on now. Yeah, so, we um, it, yeah, the, so we've tried to ease into it, but I'll get you the exact start date um, right afterward if you don't mind. Okay, Governor, do you, you're talking yeah. about the regions, and Dr. Yes. Rike Monitoon, every region in the Chicago viewing area from Lake County down to Kankakee to Will has increased almost some of them a percent in positivity rates over the last week alone. Yes. So. At this trajectory, some of them hitting 6% in two weeks, we could be at the 8% mark. So I guess why 8% mm -hmm. and not lower than that? Because clearly every single county mm -hmm. in our viewing area yeah. is on the increase right now. We actually think it's possible that regions will uh, trip the you know metrics uh, that will move it backward uh, without hitting 8%. Because remember, there's another set of metrics and that's rising positivity rates, rising hospitalizations, you know, and hospital capacity. Those are things that all play into another way that we measure these regions. So you're right, I mean, but you also see that there is one region that is very close to 8%. And so we wanted that as a fail safe, that even if, if they didn't meet the other markers, that 8% is something that's getting out of control. And so we, we will have to set in mitigations uh, when that 8% is tripped. But we honestly anticipate that uh, other regions could possibly trip this uh, by tripping these other metrics that we've set. Mm -hmm. And that when we hit 8%, are you as a governor gonna say all e-learning for the whole state? That's not what we've set out. If you go look at, yeah, what, what we have set out is a set of tiered mitigations, right? So, you know, we'll, we'll begin with uh, bars, for example, which are, you know, clearly one area where we've seen transmission where a lot of uh, uh, bars are not adhering to capacity limits, for example. Um, it, there are other things that are on the list of mitigations that, that will impose, um, including, you know, gathering limits, um, looking at specific types of gatherings. But if you go to the website where we've laid out all of those mitigations, there's a kind of a menu there that starts out with a few that are nearly automatic, and then there are others that, depending upon the region and what's going on, I would go back to something that I've talked about earlier about Metro East. There was a, uh, a party bus you know, you've, you've heard this story, right, where it got spread as a result of somebody or some group of people on the party bus at each of these 
uh, bars. And so, you know, that's an example of something that, you know, a mitigation put in place to try to limit that kind of spread where we know there's something specific that we should do. I'd like to put that mitigation in place in that region. Yeah. Governor, political question. Yes, sir. Uh, yesterday, we had a, another member of the, the Democratic State Senate call for Speaker Madigan to step down. Obviously, we know what you've said about that. But I'm curious if you, as in effect the a leader of the Democratic Party, are concerned about Commonwealth Edison issue, the Madigan issue, and how it ties into November, not just with perhaps individual races, but also as far as your big issue, uh, the uh, move to a graduated rate income tax, and whether this doesn't fuel some kind of voter cynicism about changing the tax structure. Well, let, let me begin by saying that uh, we there is genuinely a problem that needs to be addressed with ethics legislation in this state, no doubt about it. And I've been very clear about the many pieces of that uh, legislation that I will be advocating. Um, I put those out months ago, in fact. You've seen, for example, the this revolving door where people are in the legislature one day and they flip around and become a a lobbyist or a consultant the next day for Commonwealth Edison or somebody else. Um, so we need to move on ethics legislation, no doubt about it. Um, in addition to that, I would say uh, I am concerned overall there has been a history in Illinois among Republicans and among Democrats of corruption. And we have to address this. There's just no doubt. I think there's cynicism that abounds uh, among voters, and rightfully so, when you hear about what Commonwealth Edison did and what anybody that was engaged in it may have done. So uh, those are things that I worry about all the time, and I will pay very close attention. I think that it affects the politics uh, in Illinois, of course. I think that the, uh, the, the swamp uh, in Washington, D.C. that the president has created uh, is another thing that plays a role in the cynicism of people in Illinois. Um, I think we've got to address that one, too. But well, specifically with the graduated tax, though, yeah. and, and not that that was going to be any kind of slam dunk in any event, but mm -hmm. doesn't this kind of add another, perhaps, hurdle to, to that? Uh, look, I know that there are people who would like to have these things related to one another. They're not. The truth is that we have an unfair tax system in the state of Illinois in which Wealthy people pay the same rate in state taxes as people who are middle class or people who are working class. That's not fair. Um, there ought to be a higher rate for people who earn, who are millionaires and billionaires, and there ought to be a lower rate for people who are working class, middle class families trying to make ends meet. That's what this is about. I think that's what people understand about it. It's why it is doing well in general in people's minds, and I think why it'll it'll succeed. But couldn't we go? Couldn't Governor, we go to Governor, Governor Wynn is Governor guidance. from Rich Miller. The you said in January that when there's clear evidence of targeting by criminal investigators. <laughs> That's the point at which folks should step aside. Do you not see clear evidence of this with Speaker Madigan? And if not, why not? Well, I have been clear that, you know, when there is a uh, raid, uh, when there is a, an indictment, you know, I have called for people to step down from their positions or to resign. Um, so I, I, you know, I have said the same thing uh, differently, I guess, here, where I've said that, you know, if, uh, you know, if these allegations are true, the speaker should, is going to be required to resign, in my view. Um, by the way, that's the same thing that the Republican caucus leaders in the General Assembly said when they responded. That's not the same thing Senator Stain said. No. He said there's enough and he shouldn't be the head of the party. I think everybody's, as you've seen, there have been a variety of reactions to this. Um, I think there are three or four people that have uh, said what Senator Staines has said. Um, but I'm just saying this is the standard that I think is reasonable, and it's the standard I would add again that the leaders of the opposition have said as well. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.